Hello and welcome to another episode of Who Knew in the Moment, the podcast. Today, I am honored to have Eric with me. And Eric's story is going to be a fascinating one for you. And I think the reason that it's so fascinating is just the multitude of different things he's done. Uh, you know, a lot of times we have people come on and it's like, well, hey, from the get-go, I knew I wanted this. And Eric's going to give us a progression of different events. And so uh, Eric is the founder of On Air Brands, and he's a partner in the Mendado Investment Group. And then he also has some, uh, I would say, uh, side investments. And we'll get into those today. But um, as I have learned about Eric and gotten to know his story, one of the things that sticks out to me about Eric is he is dedicated to changing the future of his family. And I think that's a really important uh, factor in everything he's doing. So Eric, thanks so much for being on the show today. Yeah, I appreciate you, Phil. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. You betcha. So to start off, um, your parents are not originally from the United States. They moved here from the Philippines. So talk a little bit about just growing up in a household with first generation, uh, you know, parents and, and what that was like. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. It's, it's an interesting sort of experience and story in that, um, I, <laughs> up until the age of five, didn't realize I had a sister, an oh, wow. older sister. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll never forget, like rolling around in our apartment in Yonkers, New York, you know, with a, with a Coke bottle, uh, glass, by the way, uh, they were not plastic bottles in the seventies. <laughs> and um, I remember I used to hit my tooth on it. Uh, whenever I would <laughs> and it would always be these two liters, these massive things. So, so anyway, I remember rolling around on the carpet. My parents were like, uh, Hey son, by the way, you know, uh, you you got a sister and she's, she's on her way here. And I'm like, well, what are you talking about? <laughs> like they never freaking told me, Phil. So that, that just goes to show like my parents, um, as much as I love them, were not super aware of like what was going on in a child's mind and like how you could navigate or, or help foster any sort of ideas. And yeah. it was a weird challenge growing up um, because my parents weren't that communicative. You know, mm. like right now we have all the tools, right? We have all the resources. We're like super alert and self-aware pa as parents yeah. um, because we have all, all the stuff just readily available. But back then I get it. They, they, they came from another country. It was a challenge, right? Just to get here. Yes. Um, and a big risk for them. So I appreciate right. the fact that they did that, you know, like yeah. that was huge for them to come here, take all the risk, leave their family, leave their kid um, and and come here and risk it all for for me, I feel like you know, to, right. to start a new life. Um, so, yeah, that that was pretty much kind of the weird relationship that I had uh, coming into, <laughs> uh, you know, growing up as, as a child in the in the early days with my parents. Absolutely. Now, so many folks um, that I've interacted with that have had parents that are kind of first generation talk about, you know, just the impact of being able to see what it's like in America, but then also, you know, potentially kind of the hardships of transitioning to America. And that can be financially, that can be from a vocation. Talk a little bit about what you saw as a child, you know, from your yeah. parents and maybe how that impacted you at a young age. Well, so I don't remember them giving me hard lessons, like mm. sitting me down and talking to me. I don't really recall a lot of those conversations. Yeah. I know when my, 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 my sister came here, my father spent a lot of time with her, like yeah. I, out of guilt, out of, of you know, catching up on lost time. They, put a, they poured a lot of uh, uh, time and, and love into her and pressured her to become a lawyer or a doctor mm. or something that they deemed would be, um, you know, setting her up for success, you know? Yeah, right. So, so with me, they left me to my own vices and my own sort of like, <laughs> let this kid figure it out. You know, like, you know, you know, that scene in Christmas story where he's like, ho, ho, ho. And he like kicks him down the slide. <laughs> that was, that was me in my life, uh, you know, somewhat neglected, but good. It, it worked out in my favor, right? Because yeah. it gave me opportunities to experiment. It gave me opportunities to take risks. Uh, you know, I'd be out late at night on my bike in, in the middle of Yonkers slash the Bronx because yeah. we weren't in the suburbs. We were in the projects at the time. They weren't called the projects because they were brand new buildings, for uh. brand spanking <laughs> new buildings. And I'll never forget my parent. My dad's always like, why do you call the projects? Why do you call the Bronx? I'm like, because we were in the projects uh, when you think about it. Um, you know, like kids were trying to rob me every other day. Yeah. You know, it, it was it was rough neighborhood. And um but it, but it gave me street smarts, you know, mm -hmm. it, it created a self-awareness in terms of like my environment. Like I was always, uh, uh, paying attention to everything yeah. around me. 
Um, so, you know, probably saved my life many, many times that I, you know, can't really necessarily recall. But um, yeah, that that was always a challenge. And what I learned from them were just seeing them navigate through America mm. and keeping up with the Joneses. And, and, right. and culturally, I'm going to generalize here, and I hope I don't offend too many people. But from yeah. my perspective of the Philippines, bro, is uh, they, they, they're, they're about keeping up with the Joneses. Right? Yeah. They're about materialistic things to satisfy and fill a hole and avoid. Mm. And, and, and there's an identity crisis going on, I feel, over there because it's like, you know, they they were royal, ruled by I think the, the the Chinese for centuries, and then it was, and then the conquistadors came, and then like mm. gave everyone Spanish last names, you know, and then yeah. and then you know, and then the Americans, and then like and they're like, who are we? What are we? What's our culture? You know, so yeah. I think they that when they came, what they collectively are always like, we we adopt anything, you know, we we love hip hop or we love country or we love like it's everything, and that's what it was cool about growing up that I, I, I kind of, it was in my DNA to be able to yeah. adapt, be a chameleon. But anyway, they, they weren't financially literate. You know, mm. they, 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 they put a lot of money on credit cards and I saw them do things like, like uh, file for bankruptcy, wow. uh, things like that, where we were struggling. We had the cars, we had the house, we had all the stuff. It looked like we were, we were financially set. But behind the scenes, I saw everything and I realized those were lessons for me and I'm gonna make sure I don't do that crap. So, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's impactful, right? At a young age to see that and then know, all right, that's probably not the way I should be uh, purchasing things or the way I should use my money. Don't get me wrong. I, I did it I, in my twenties and my thirties. I was, I was really ir irresponsible. Um, you know, I didn't get to the point where, you know, they had no choice, but to file for bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. But um, for me, like, I see, I, I recognize the signs and the red yeah. flags where I'm like, okay, I think I'm following in their footsteps and I need to course correct, but it took me a while, you know, it yeah. took me decades to realize it and, and, and meet the right people and surround myself with the right people to kind of elevate my mindset. Absolutely. So you, you decide, uh, through high school, you know, you said, Hey, I was a chameleon, you know, I kind of fit in with all different groups. You you met a lot of different people and you decide to go to college. And today we might call what you studied, I don't know what, like graphic design or something along those lines, but then it was a different title. Yeah. You've been listening to my shows and I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Back in the day in the mid nineties, I guess, early nineties, because uh, I graduated uh, high school in 1990, they would call it commercial art. So I remember telling my family or telling my friends, like, I'm going to school for commercial art. <laughs> And they would go, what is that? <laughs> and I'll say, well, you know, the stuff you get in the mail or a, or a billboard on the sidewalk or, you know, and then they're like, oh, that stuff. I'm like, that's graphic. I didn't call it graphic design. That's commercial art. Yeah. I don't know. At some point, Phil, the awareness just grew, you know, and, and, yeah. and, and, and it was started, they started to label it graphic design, uh, which was now, right? It's everyone's right. a designer and everyone uses canva and everyone has the ability that i spent years honing that skill so yeah it's interesting uh how it's all evolved it's pretty cool yes so as you're progressing through college you know once again you start enjoying the work and whatnot and then it's time to make a choice of what do i want to do and a uh, company offers you what 55 dollars an hour yeah i uh so my very first job, I wanted to share this story. Oh, yeah. I, I've been I've been listening to your show as well as um, the the very first job. I've never told this. So this is the first uh, on your show. Love My it. very first job offer. So, I, you know, I graduated from School of Visual Arts. Right. I, yeah. um, you know, I had a leg up because back in the day, that meant something like, oh, it's on your resume. You went to a really good school in Manhattan. <laughs> Like now it doesn't, who cares? I don't, right. I hire people. I don't even know if they graduate high school, to be honest, <laughs> as long as they have the skill sets and they're accountable and they do their job. Yes. So, so uh, yeah, I don't know. It's all changing, but back then it was cool. So they would, they, I went to dozens and dozens and dozens of interviews back when you used to fax your resume to, <laughs> to, to companies. And I would yeah. take all these interviews and I'll never forget. I had a couple of offers, uh, you know, after a few weeks of pounding the pavement. And the very first one was Playboy magazine. Ah. And boy, my dad would have been so proud if I took that job. Um, it, you know, because it, it was a huge brand. 
right. um, you know, every little, little horny boy's dream to, to be surrounded <laughs> by amazing, you know, models who don't mind taking their clothes off. Um, and, and I, I really thought about it. And the reason I had to turn it down was I was dating this girl, Sandra, mm -hmm. who we went to college together and she was a very devoted Christian Catholic, you know, and, yeah. and I think I couldn't not just break her, like I couldn't break her heart. I couldn't break her mother's heart. Right. Like, her mom looked up to me. And if I did that, Phil, mm -hmm. It was over. Like, yeah, game over. I can't imagine yeah. that would have went well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My dad. Here's the. Like, imagine the dilemma. Like, I'm like, my dad would love me, and then my girlfriend's mom will hate me. So it was like, ah. But uh, anyway, I, I waited, and I got a better opportunity in the fashion industry, uh, which was close to where she lived. And um, yeah, it all worked out. I stayed stayed there for four years and learned a ton, and they gave me a ton of opportunities. Um, but yeah, the with the instance you're talking about. Yeah. I, so I was in, I was in and out of jobs after I left that, that opportunity. And it's like family. That's when I realized corporate America was like, yeah, I mean, you could like have a separate family outside of your family. Mm. And we got really close, but I had to go. It was time to go. I had other job offers. Um, and I was bouncing around from big ad agency to ad agency in New York city. And that was fun because I, 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 I lived by my own schedule. Like I right. could work whenever I wanted to and make as much as I wanted to or little, and there was one offer that said, Hey, you know, it was during that time of freelancing, there was an opportunity in Princeton, New Jersey. And I was like, I never heard of it. <laughs> and they're like, it's for a company called, I don't, yeah, I don't want to promote here, but you know, it was one of the big pharma companies, I yes. think uh, probably the top 15. And I was like, never heard of them. And they're like, well, did you ever hear of Kerry Lotion and Theragran and all these pills? And I'm like, yeah, I have those in my cabinet. <laughs> oh, yeah, they want to pay you 50, 55 bucks an hour. I'm like, what? I think I was making uh, maybe anywhere between 25 to 35 an hour. Right. But this was a big jump. Yeah. So, so Phil, I was like, how do I not, how, how do I, I have to say yes. I don't know where this is. It was probably an hour and a half by train, yeah. um, door to door. And, I never left, dude. It, <laughs> they, I, I went there for three months. They called me back and they said, Hey, you've been gone for a month, but we, we miss you. You're, you're doing, you did a fantastic job. Everybody's talking about you coming back. What do you think about coming back? And I'm like, cool. How long, much longer do you need me? Like indefinitely dude, eight, seven, eight years later, man. Uh, that's where I met my wife. Yeah. So, I was going to say, it's important yeah. that you went there. Cause you met someone yeah. important. Thank you. Thank you. you. I love how you do your freaking research, man. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. So, but something I want to highlight there, um, I think a lot of times people will say, hey, I, I'm planning to go into this industry and then they're not willing to pivot or they just kind of, you know, keep beating the same thing and maybe they're not getting the traction that they'd want. And then they're scared to make a transition. So talk a little bit about that for you, transitioning a, a couple, a few different times and maybe what the thought process was behind it and then the value that you gained from making transitions. You mean, so from transitioning from, from like New York city to New Jersey, yeah, from, company to company or, you know, yeah. Geographic yeah. location to geographic location. Yeah. And then also industry to industry. I, I, yeah. I was getting other offers and, and I'll mention them here since, since I haven't mentioned them in other shows before I'm just giving you, since you put all your work in here, man, I'm going to give you some, some, some <laughs> choice guy. here. This is cool. So when I was leaving Manhattan, um, I had other job offers and target called me before mm -hmm. anyone they were like hey we're a, we're a minnesota based company you never heard of us there was no target around here yet right. and they were like we 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 love your resume we love what you've done and how about you come here and be one of our art directors and help us build and i spent hours i had multiple multiple interviews with them um and they were like you got to move to minnesota <laughs> and I couldn't think, I couldn't fathom like leaving the friends that I had built in New York city and yeah. like the life and the energy and going to like a completely different world. Right. No right. offense to, to you know, Midwest, right? I know you're yeah. Midwest. Hey, you're good. But, None taken. But, it, but I just got to New York and I'm living in New York. I'm living the dream. Right. And I was like, I, so I said, no, second offer came in. It was Bloomingdale's the probably one of the biggest next to Macy's and yeah. department stores. And I said, no, and I'll never forget. I went on the interview, Phil, and they wanted to hire me on the spot. And I said, no. And they literally, as I'm walking out the door, the VP says, why did you come here? Why did you, <laughs> why did you interview with us? And like, it was, I was a child. I was an idiot. You know, I was like, yeah. it was for my ego. 
right? Ah, just to know. Yeah. And, 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 you know, 20 plus years later, tell Phil that I turned Bloomingdale's <laughs> down. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it made no sense. Why did I take the interview? I never, I love the, it. The, reason, the reason why, brother, is I didn't want to get pigeonholed as a fashion, you mm. know, creative, you know, department store guy. Yeah. Like that, I felt like I had done it for years already and and I was getting pigeonholed and 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 if I stayed there that's all I was going to ever be. Yeah. So that's why I think I took the pharma company opportunity because it was something new, something different. It was a risk. I didn't know yeah. anything about that industry, but I was right. I was willing to learn. Yes. Um and plus the money was good. <laughs> <laughs> but that that little sidebar too, yeah. yeah exactly. Well, I think that's a great thing to highlight, though, is, you know, so many jobs and industries is like if someone's sitting here listening right now and they're like, I'm not loving what I'm doing, but I don't know other things. If you have good work ethic, right, if you're a trustworthy person and you're willing to learn, you can pretty much transcend into any industry. Now, it's going to be difficult, right? It's going to take a lot of effort. But just because you've been doing a certain type of work or a certain job or a certain industry for 10 years, doesn't mean that transitioning is impossible. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's opportunities. Right. And yeah. I, I, I love how people, you know, especially my family, you know, they're very superstitious and my mother, especially, you know, okay. you know, good luck. And, 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 and I used to appreciate it, but now I just, I despise that word. Cause it's like, there's no such thing as luck. Yes. Right? And I always say to her over and over and over and anybody else who says good luck to me, not everyone, cause that would be obnoxious, but <laughs> You know, I'm like, luck is when preparation and hard work meet opportunity. I right? love it. You were yep. prepared for that moment. And when the opportunity came, you took it, right? You took it and you were able to take advantage of it because you prepped. And yes. that's the thing. It's like luck just sounds like, oh, willy nilly, I did nothing in my life. And I just land like a lotto ticket. I found right, it on the yeah. street. You know, yeah. that's not that. That's luck. Yes. Right? That's dumb luck. Nope. Uh, but yeah, a lot of the people out there who, who bust their butts and work and work and work for something to finally come to fruition and somebody to come knocking on the door and say, Hey, would you love to do this with us? Yeah. And then you're like, uh, yeah, why are you talking to me? <laughs> it's, oh, it makes sense. I've been killing myself to get here. Mm, I love that. That's so true. And so good. Yes. So as you're uh, moving through, uh, you know, corporate America, once again, there's um, a lot of pros, there's certain cons that come with it. And you get to this point where you're looking at a potential transition. And you had thought, you know, what can I be doing to generate wealth? And there's this layover of time. And you ask your wife, Honey, how much time would I have before I would have to make a financial decision to, to go back to work? And she's got it all figured out. For <laughs> so good. So good. Yeah. Before we, we, we highlight how amazing my wife is. It's so funny that you're, you're bringing this up because I was literally just, I'm, I'm, I'm in the process of writing a book. My oh, first. cool. Um, thank you. And, and I, and I, and she was like, you know, that you're writing this book because of me, right? Like, like I, I allowed you to do all this. But anyway, I'm like, man, I must, the fact that she's saying that and it's not a joke, I'm like, I need to pour into her more and like recognize her more. So I'm glad you bring this up uh, here on the show. So I'll be like, hey, listen to Phil's show, yeah, especially exactly. this time frame where I talk about you. <laughs> um, but yeah, so so here's, here's, let me just paint the picture of what happened. Yeah. So in corporate America for over 20 years, right? Just yep. the grind, cube life, you know, water cooler talking about, you know, what was on TV that night. And it was like Groundhog's Day. I was Bill Murray in Groundhog's Day. <laughs> and even though I had a lot of friends that I like to drink with, you know, and I met my wife there and we had a ton of fun in our 20s and 30s, we, were ha we had a family now, yeah. right? And we had, we had one and she was pregnant with a second. Mm -hmm. And I, I got to the point in my career, Phil, where I built a company internally for the, the number one pharma company at the time. Yeah. They had a very flat $500,000 a year for like, I don't know, forever for like yeah. five to 10 years. And it was just, it was just a creative agency that they serviced their own brands right. and over and over and over. And there was like four or five people with like maybe five or 10 people on the bench. So they were like, Hey, Eric, what can you do here? What can you do to sort of up our game? Cause you're, you're, you're now known as the internal creative guy. Yeah. So I'm like, I, I was scared to death. I had never led at that level. Like it was just me. It was all on me. Right. So they, 
So the company that I worked for literally dropped me in, you know, like, you know, like I was a guy in my parachute and, and, and like, boom, boots on the ground. And then I just observed for like yeah. four to six weeks and I took notes and then I reported back to my team like, okay, I realized what, here's what's going on here. This person is really toxic. This person's a rock star. Da, yeah. da, da, da. So like I would report and I started to analyze and break down what was needed to make this place better. Oh, Long story yeah. short, we got all the resources we needed. We grew that company from a half a million dollars a year to 2.4. I, I always remember it's anywhere. It was like two to two, two and a half million uh, yeah. a year, right? In 18 months, bro. In 18 That's months. That's huge. And we grew from five people to 25 with a dozen plus on the bench. Wow. So the, the, the team grew, the, the, the company grew. And then I realized um, when they said, hey, Eric, we love you and we love what you've done and what the team has done, but we're going to outsource everything to India and, and, and Ireland. And I was like, ah, oh, all this hard work. And it made, and then they, they said, you know what? You can, you have to lay everyone off that you hired. Oh my goodness. And you will be the last one out the door. Like, like an episode of cheers. I'm throwing a lot of old, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. an old dude. You know, like, like yeah. An, yeah. the final episode of a show where you like walk out of the set and you close the door and you shut the light with a, you know, oh a tear going goodness. down your cheek. Yeah. And that was me. Like I laid everyone off. But during the process, bro, is when I discovered like, what do I do? What do I what am I gonna do next? Like right. I'm not appreciated if I if I continue doing what I'm doing for another company. Um, it's not fulfilling. It's not doing anything for me and my family other than making the same amount of money over and over and over. It was Groundhog's Day. So that's the long sort of yeah, you know, colorful sort of canvas that I'm trying to put together. Um so at that moment, I asked my wife and during the time frame of transition, because I had three months to lay everyone off, I listened and discovered Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert yes. Kiyosaki, the purple pill. I was going to say, as you affectionately call it, the purple pill. The yes. purple pill, man. And I took it and I, and I remember, bro, literally punching the steering wheel during my one and a half, uh, one hour and a half commute each way. And like, I was just so angry and frustrated but also inspired to to do something more and that's when i had the conversation with my wife i'm like hey you know i got an offer it's the other 100 it's the other number one pharma company and they're like hey you, we need you you're the only dude build an, an an ad agency a creative agency in new york city and chicago and we need you to fly back and forth and you got to go there <laughs> twice a month uh and stay there a week and my whole life flashed before my eyes phil i was right. like holy smokes this is a wonderful opportunity. Wow, I, I made it. Um, and then I just saw myself getting fatter and miserable <laughs> and, right, and, and just not around and missing yeah. you know, the second child's birth and like all this stuff. I was like, I don't know if I want that. Yeah. So I said, no, another, another opportunity where they were like, what, what? <laughs> like the needle on the record. Yeah. <laughs> they literally were like, what? You're turning this down? This yeah. amount of money, this opportunity to build in New York City and Chicago? I'm like, I, I, it's not the right time. Uh, yeah. I'm done. I'm done. So then my wife said, you're right. Um, and I'm, I'm with you 100%. What do you need? And I'm like, how much we just did the math, you know, let's put pen to paper. Let's see what our annual nut is. Meaning like, what do yep. we spend a year? We saw, we saw it was about 84 grand a year. And I was like, wow. Okay. If you continue to work, you will cover that nut and more she, cause she makes good money. And then if I build and create and take the risk, also how much savings do we have? Like how much is in the bank? And I'm blessed because really she, she had it all figured out. Yeah. We had about a year to two years of savings. So yeah. she's like, go do, go do your thing, bro. And that was it. The, the permission was granted. And that's why we're talking. I wouldn't be here having this wonderful conversation with you if it weren't for her blessing me. You yeah. Go and be successful. So let's talk about that. And I think it's, you know, an interesting um, kind of juxtaposed position here, right? Uh, you saw growing up how your parents managed their finances and it was bankruptcy. It was, you know, overspending. And then you and your wife spend finances a little bit differently. You have the foresight to put money away, right? And that allows opportunity. So um, I think, you know, once again, Consciously, subconsciously, I'm, I'm sure it was a bit of both, right? You said, I want a different financial future than what my parents or what I saw from my parents. 
a hundred percent. Like I, I didn't know what it was. I thought it was stocks. You know, I was like, okay, we, we've invested in stocks, you know, with wins and losses. Yeah. Uh, but you know, w- w- we get a healthy return th- that are pa- it's passive, right? So I understood the concept, even though I had an employee mindset and a scarcity mindset and limiting beliefs. I had a guilty as charged, all that yeah. stuff. Yep. Um, but I, I saw our stocks, you know, made us, you know, five figures a year and we didn't have to do anything. Yeah. So I was like, okay, let me study that a little more. But then as I was looking into that real estate popped up, yes. right? The algorithms, the, the, the gods and what I thought was the universe, it's <laughs> Facebook algorithms. They're yeah. like, Hey, you read rich dad, poor dad. Maybe you'd be interested in real estate. Did you know Robert Kiyosaki is going to be in Edison, New Jersey? And I'm like, no, what a quinky dink. Yeah. <laughs> so, I had no idea I was going down a funnel. So I went to this free you know, seminar that, you know, was like going to teach us all about real estate investing. And I was like, Whoa, my mind is blown. This is a fire hose of information and they're just giving it for free. Oh, heck no. 500 people in the room. You're going to buy a course and it's going to cost anywhere between $1,000 to (laughs) $25,000. Take right. Take your pick. What can you afford? And do you have six credit cards on you? (laughs) So, and, and we're giving away iPads. I mean, it was, it was a master class in like, funnel creation and getting people to buy a program. Yes. And, and I'm a sucker for those things, bro. Literally. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so I bought in, I did, I bought in, uh, probably yeah, five figures in and, and my wife, of course, you know, trusting me, Gosh, I don't know why you should trust me. It's crazy. <laughs> so, um, but I brought her along. I, t- I bought one stock course. It was a weekend, like, you know, two days. Mm-hmm. And one was stock and another one was real estate. And we were going to decide yep. and we decided on real estate and, and dude, it, it broke everything open, even though yeah. it was a crazy expensive program, it opened my mind. It, it was an education for me to, to get access, uh, not just to people, uh, but the concept in my head that yes. this is doable and it's real and it's not like a sham. And, uh, you know, uh, it's not just for the Trumps of the world. Yeah. And I was like, oh man, this is like the way they spoke to us, bro. was like, we were like you, we were, we were big dummies <laughs> in credit card debt and, and we're here to give you the pill and Yeah, take it and go down the rabbit hole. Well, so I think something that's important to highlight and dive into there is investing in yourself, right? Sometimes people look at it as a cost and and it's an investment, right? Hey, that money that I spent is going to help me not have to have this financial obligation later because I'm, I'm learning it before I run into the problem, right? Um, I'm able to not have to do all the same dumb mistakes that someone else did because they're teaching me, Hey, don't do that because here's what I did and here's how much it cost me. So talk a little bit about just your willingness to say, yes, this is an investment. I get it. It's expensive. But if I do this, then I'm going to double step ahead and not have to do some of the other dumb mistakes I would have probably made. Yeah, it, it, it totally made sense, right? It's funny how we, we're, we're quick to spend, you know, 10, 20, 40, 50, $100,000 on, on education, like school. Like, I want to yep. go to Harvard. I want to go to college. I want to go wherever. And it costs yeah. you know, so much money. That is an investment in, in, in ourselves, like you said, but we don't talk about it that way. I saw this as the same thing. Like I am going to school and it's mm. truncated, right? Yep. In a short, I don't have to dedicate four years of my life to yeah. learn how to become a real estate investor. I'm going to do it over the course of a year. And dude, it, it, it really is about you, how much drive, hustle, inspiration, you know, that you put it, it really, it's just like the gym. You have to show up. Right. And you have to put the work in to get results. A lot of people think they're going to buy a program and then, then, you know, someone's going to teach them how to do everything and give them all the tools that they need, but then they can just sit back and be Mm -hmm. lazy. Right. And, and and go eat chips and watch Netflix, you know, uh, which I love to do by the way, but, um, it's, (laughs) but only like maybe, but anyway, it's, it's, it's interesting because people have to understand if you invest in anything, what are, it doesn't matter what the cost is, right? Think okay. about what you're going to create as a result of having that knowledge in your head and then taking action, mm. action, 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 and not being paralyzed by, you know, paralysis, paralysis by analysis and having all the information. I used to go to these, these programs, wonderful. Like, like it was like a wedding, like a ball. Like, yeah. 
something out of a Disney movie where I was like, oh, where's Cinderella? Like it was so much money. They took our money and they, it was well spent. Yeah. This is beautiful, beautiful places. Um, and I would meet people and, and Phil, they, we would have lanyards with our name and they'd give you ribbons for every course you're taking, you know, wholesale, uh -huh. rental, flipping, you know, yeah. not but they, but they would have all these different things, you know, creative financing. I would literally see people who would have 12 labels like of 12 courses, I think I did three, right? Yeah. And, and their eyes were popping out of their heads, right? Like, like a deer in headlights. Cause there was so much information. I'm like, you just bought the biggest program probably for 50 K, yeah. but there's too much. You can't execute on all those ideas. Mm, so yes. that's the thing. Like you, 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 you have to understand, don't fall prey to analysis by paralysis, focus on one thing and just get it done. And that's what I did. I bought a multifamily within eight months. And that's when I saw, I'm like, wow, now there's infinite return on that investment because I, I, I bird it, right? They did the, I, I refied it. So anyone who I bought uh, just for simple math, say it was a hundred thousand yep. dollars. We bought it cash, right? It's a multifamily. And I did the numbers. You got to make sure you do due diligence before you buy anything to make sure that it cash flows. So meaning the rental, the, the rent coming in from the tenants are paying for the mortgage or whatever. Correct. Right? And the insurance and all the stuff and the capital expenditures, meaning like just in case a flood or a lightning bolt hits the, you know, you could pay for it. Right. Yep. So you have, you have capital set aside for that. So that, that is an education, right. That, yeah. that, that I, that I adopted. So then, um, bought it for hundred K cash and then I put tenants in it, right. Cause it wasn't performing. There was one deadbeat guy, nice guy, but he wasn't paying the rent. So I, so I had to evict him. And I got two amazing people in there and families and they started paying the rent. And then after a year, they saw like, uh, you know, how much money I was making from these rentals. And I brought it to the bank or a lender. And I said, Hey, look at what I did. And they said, we're not basing this loan on you, Eric Cabral. We're basing this loan on the performing asset, that mm -hmm. building and how much income it brings. And it looks like you more than cover the nut. Right. And so, yeah. Here's a, here's a mortgage and dude, literally pretty much 80 to 90% of my money back. So they wrote me a check for yep. like 75, $80,000. And they're like, here you go. No tax, <laughs> right? That's yeah. how the, that's how it works. All of this works because the tax code was written to benefit the people who understand the game. So I was right. like, oh damn. So then like I showed my wife the check. I'm like, we got all our money back. And meanwhile, it's a performing asset. It makes us, you know, ten to fifteen thousand dollars a year passive. I do nothing. It's infinite returns. Which that one property, bro, has more than paid the investment I made on the education with Rich Dad. Absolutely. Once again, that's how it's an investment, right? Because with that knowledge, you're able to pay that back. So that is your first entry into the real estate game, correct? Correct. Yeah. Now, did I understand correctly? Did you ever do a flip? I was no. So okay. technically, no. I, I I bought properties and then I you know I crapped the bed because like I wasn't wise enough. I was too cocky and I didn't do my due diligence. So I, I lost money on some of those <laughs> just because um I didn't do it right. Yeah, and I had to pull out of deals where I had I had put uh, earnest money deposits down. Okay. And stuff. Uh, so no, I never actually did a physical flip, but that was what I was planning to do. But then when I got the rental, that was pretty much turnkey. I had yeah. to do some slight renovations to it. Yep. I said, this is the way to do it. Let's just buy multifamilies. Absolutely. And hold them. Yeah, buy and hold. Yes. Buy and hold. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So additionally, um, Eric, you, you've formed so many partnerships. I, I'm going to want to talk about just you know why and what value that adds to you. But as that's been going on, um, a friend of yours gives you an opportunity to uh, potentially invest into a winery. Yeah, it's it's really bizarre how the universe works. So because I did that deal, Phil, I mm -hmm. I I stood out from the local real estate investing community because a lot of them kick tires, a lot of them get caught with analysis by paralysis. So they saw me elevate within seven, eight months and they're like, how did you do it? So I started presenting, you know, to the room and then eventually took over the Princeton, New Jersey meetup yeah. uh, and then got on the board, right? So of uh, over a thousand members, all because of that one deal, bro. And all because I, I like to inspire and I like to talk, right? Yeah. Um, and, and, and just give it all away. 
So I was on stage one day at one of these events and lo and behold, there's a guy in the room that I had never met before. And he comes up to me after the event. He's like, you're amazing. I want to do something with you. I, I, you have a podcast I hear. And I'm like, yeah, it's called entrepreneur circle. He's like, I want a podcast. I've been sitting on this for years. He's like, can you help me? I had never produced anyone's show other than myself. Right. Yeah. He's like, but I want you to do it with me. Like you be my co-host. I'm like, what? This is crazy. We put pen to paper. We started meeting. We saw that we had a lot of chemistry and he's like, by the way, I'm doing a deal and I'm going to buy the second oldest winery in the country. <laughs> and he's like, you want to come check it out? And I'm like, yeah, sure. I went there and I was blown away by not just the property, but him, like getting yeah. to know him and his vision and what he planned to do with this 242 acre property, which had a golf course, a full yeah. golf course. It had a 50 room hotel. It had wine tours. You know, it, it had so much going for it. And I, I, couldn't imagine like this one dude who I like to call the Disney of the resort flipping uh, industry, you know, was going to actually execute on this, but his passion for it and the way he spoke about it and all his ideas, I was like, I I'm all in, man. I'm drinking the Josh McCallan Kool-Aid. I don't care what this property is. I I'm more in love with you. Yeah. So I was like, how can I help you? Number one, let's produce the podcast. Number two, let me guess you guessed on my show. Let's talk about the property. I want to do anything and everything that I can to elevate and, and, and create awareness for what you're trying to do. Yeah. Dude, fast forward three years later. And so I'm, I'm a general partner in that, in that deal. And we went from a $5 million property to now going to potentially be evaluated as an over $30 million property, which is insane. Yeah. And, you know, we're blessed because, you know, of him, number one, and, yep. and his family and his vision. But then also all the investors that came on board as a result of our efforts of, mm -hmm. of, of speaking in, on stages and doing podcasts and just meeting and greeting people and letting them know that we're legit. Uh, that's how powerful was what we do on this podcast. Yeah. You know, people get to know, like, and trust us. And they see that we're not going anywhere. We're not a flash in the pan. We're not just going to take your money and run. And now it's just amazing what's happening over there. Yeah. Really so, cool. so talk a little bit about that deal specifically. Is that something that you guys, you know, had investors put money into? And so, Hey, we have, you know, the general partners are the two of us. And then we have, you know, people have invested in it, or talk a little bit about how that deal kind of came to be. Yeah. So, so Josh, uh, came from, f from the resort business, right? He was, he was working for a high net worth individual. So he had private money. Yeah. It was, it was, it was, it was one guy who funded everything and he was flipping resorts in, in the Cape May area on the beach. Okay. Right? So he got a lot of, uh, experience and know-how from, from doing that and creating yeah. seriously performing assets on the beach. Um, so he got sort of relatively famous in that industry, but then he got bought out. All right. So he, now he had, a, he had a capital event. He took that cash and he invested all of it into Renault. Right. Got it. He was like, and he knew that was the catalyst to create more. Yes. So, you know, now we've acquired another property in Maryland called Kent Island, which we've okay. now rebranded as Kent Island Resort. Uh, and we're doing the same thing. Yeah. So the thing that, that, that was, was when I met him in that mo moment in time, he was transitioning from like a W2 guy who just had a capital event to a guy who needed to raise money. Yeah. So he leveraged me and my network. Mm. And we started to reach out to people who knew how to raise capital. A good yeah. friend of mine, Matt Faircloth, literally wrote the book uh, called Raising Private Capital. So he <laughs> got involved. The, the, yeah, the three of us started like, you know, meeting and talking and networking and finding more people. Before we knew it, we were like, okay, we need to syndicate this. Meaning, um, you know, everyone uh, who is interested in the project, loves it and, 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 and trusts in it, uh, are going to put in their capital in order to be a part of the deal. Yeah. Right? As, a, as a limited partner. So it's passive for them. Yep. They get paid dividends every quarter. So we got dozens and dozens of people to sign on. And now we've created this insanely performing asset. That's just like a gem, um, in, 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 in New Jersey. And it's, it's, it's really powerful. What could be done if you really, really just trust in each other and then share what you're trying to do and then execute on it. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I think that's a great thing to point out. I mean, if you're going to go into partnership with someone, it should be someone that, I mean, you trust because as they say it in business, I mean, that that's your new marriage, right? Uh, yeah. you, you don't want to have to go through a business divorce uh, that, that can be bad for you know investments and things like that. But uh, yeah, you really need to do your due diligence first before uh, entering into a business partnership. Yeah, 100%. And that's what's the so powerful, you know, I'm always talking about networking and, yeah. and, and people just see that as this thing where like, yeah, I'm going to go, I'm going to go walk in the room. I'm going to pass out business cards. Oh, no, not, no, no, no. This, what you and I are doing is networking. You know, yep. what, what, what you can do now more than ever is, is so powerful to leverage all these tools like podcasting or or going yeah. to events and meeting other people or joining masterminds. It's such a way to kind of quick, like fast forward the time frame of no like, and trust. Yep. Right? Because podcasts allow people to just deep dive, right? Not listen right. to you, you listen to me. And then like, Oh, I, I got a primer. I understand. I like this guy. I hear his core values, yeah. you know, I, his, his belief system and he's a family guy or whatever it is. And then all of a sudden, boom, they show up at your doorstep or their property and they, they go, I want to invest with you. I like your story. Yes, that's so true. Yes, I love the clarifier on what is networking. That's good. Yeah. Now, in addition, so we've got on-air brands and there's multiple podcasts that, that are encompassed by that. But talk a little bit about the beginning of the podcast game. And uh, once again, kind of that, you said it a few times, but you know, just setting analysis by paralysis sign and say, hey, I'm going to jump in. And then uh, kind of the business that ended up being created from that. Yeah. Like, like I said, when I met Josh McCallan, uh, he wanted a podcast for himself. And what I started to notice, and, and, and I didn't have that in my uh, business plan for yeah. on-air brands. And, you know, we were a traditional marketing agency doing mm -hmm. logos, branding, websites, social media marketing, and we were doing live events as well. Um, yeah. So it was interesting that he was asking me that and 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 i said let me try it out it sounds really really fun you know i want to hang out with you and plus i'm getting to know you because i want to i want to be a part of that deal yeah right, right. <laughs> so it was like a win 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 all around yes. and um so i got to spend a lot of time with him and started to build this brand it's our show called capital hacking yeah. um and uh we're blessed because we like had robert kiyosaki on it yeah. early in the stages i'm like what this is like you know this is, we already hit the Holy grail. Now what yeah. do we do? Let's, let's hang up our mics. <laughs> what episode? So, um, it's over. Yeah. What episode? We're done. And, um, yeah. So as I started to do that with him and I started to interview more people for my show and for that show, people started to hear the quality, right. Yeah. And, and started to appreciate what we were doing. And this was, you know, for, you know, three, four or five years ago. And it, it isn't what it is today where now there's a little more tools, there's a little more awareness, but still right. people were kind of like, I just guessed it on your show. Can you make a show for me? That was like the, um, the ongoing thing, which started to build on your brands yeah. and the, the creative and production aspect of podcasting. And I was like, whoa, this is cool. And slowly I started to realize I'm going to shed all the other stuff we're doing. We still have some legacy clients like in technology and stuff that we don't produce podcasts for, but now the core of what we do is that we just like doubled, tripled, you know, 10 X that service because we found real estate investors want to be podcasters or yeah. they want to guest on podcasts. So that's really what started it all. It was really people that I was just meeting it within my network and partnering with and having them as a guest. And it's, it's wonderful. I love it. So at, on one of your uh, podcasts, there was a individual that came to you and said, Hey, I, I like to work with you. Um, and you said, well, if you come work for me for free for a year, then I'll let you come on in. And I, I want to hear a little bit about that story because I want to highlight this, <laughs> this gentleman, but I, I like this story. So talk a little bit about that. Uh, I'm trying to remember. Uh, I think I know who you're talking about. Um, he kept showing up. That's the thing that was weird. Yeah. He, he kept showing up over and over, not just to, to, uh, like the studio, but like to events. And he was there, he was doing exactly what I was doing when I was trying to get into real estate is I would walk into the room. I didn't know anyone and I would stay till the very end. And I would talk to the organizers of the event and I would just have conversations, ask questions, 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 eat humble pie because I would yeah. put, you know, chairs on top of tables and help them pack the, the, the car and the truck up. Meanwhile, these, these kids were half my age, right? They're in their twenties. I'm in my forties. And I'm like, teach me Obi-Wan, you know? Yeah, right. Um, so it reminded me of me, like this kid's hustle 
you know, he was much, much younger than I was, but he kept showing up and putting chairs up and like, put it, I'm like, who is, I, I didn't notice him at first. Like my team noticed him. They're like, you ever meet that kid? And I'm like, no, who are you talking about? But eventually he showed up on my radar and I was like, why don't you come hang out um, at our, at our, the honor brand studio. And uh, I don't, he's like, well I, well, I don't know what to do. And I'm like, you'll figure it out. And he figured it out and he just hung out and eventually, yeah, he just started becoming a paid employee. Uh, but just kept showing up and helping and put, pouring into us. And then we realized, yeah, it's time to, time to pour it into this kid. See, and I, I love that. And I want to highlight that because I think too frequently, uh, you know, we want to be the entry level CEO or we want the immediate return on our time. And it's like, sometimes your ability to learn is the immediate return, right? It's not always this big financial, um, you know, check or this, Hey, yeah. Instantly Eric was like, sure. We'll pay you 20 bucks an hour. No. I mean, the kid's like, well, I'll volunteer my time, but I believe by doing that, I'm going to gain so much, you know, knowledge from you guys that someday it might turn into a job, but I'm at least going to gain the knowledge. Yeah. It, it, it's, it goes right to the Jim Rohn quote, yeah. right? It's, it's not how much will I make from this opportunity, but what will I become mm. this opportunity? And yep. he fully adopted that. Like he yeah. understood like, this is the way I need to live. And it opened up his world. Like he, he looked up to bigger pockets. He looked up to, to what we were doing. He looked up to all these brands and now he was a part of it. He was in the room with us, you know, having listening, a fly on the wall, listening to all these conversations from all these amazing people that we have access to and eventually met all of his heroes, you know, came, we yeah. brought him to the bigger pockets conference and he met Brandon Turner and Josh Dory and everybody. And he was like, um, I can't believe this is happening. It's a year into it. And this is my dream. Here's the cool thing. Fast forward. We pour into our team in a way that I wish it was like this when I was in, in corporate America. Yeah. We invest in them, yep. right? We invest time and energy and we, we, we celebrate wins. Like I adopt a lot of like what, we, what I've learned in masterminds and I bring it to the team. I love it. And every, every morning, every Monday morning we go, okay, let's celebrate. Let's go around the room and let's celebrate a win, you know, or, or an ask, right? And you can, or a, a lesson learned through failure. So I'm bringing all these concepts that like multimillionaires do, and I'm bringing it to, to, to the honor brands team. Anyway, long story short, this guy that we're talking about elevated to the point where now he's running his own business and with love, bro, we were like, we're going to miss the heck out of you, but God bless and more power to you. We support and love anything and everything that you do. And that's what we're here for. We're here to elevate you, your mind, give you opportunities outside of us. Right. Yep. So now he's, he's, he's got his own construction business and that's what he wanted to do. He didn't want to build podcasts, yeah. but he was doing it and he was learning, he was absorbing and he, and he was networking. Like he I love it. Yeah. I love it. So as any business um, grows and does different things, you pivot and now you're even doing some like uh, short-term, I guess we'll call it loans uh, for people to help them on deals. So talk a little bit about how you got started in that avenue. Yeah. So when I took my course, you know, in Rich Dad, one of them was creative financing. Yeah. And they used to always talk about all these different ways that you can get your deals financed, right? Other right. people's money. And then I realized, wait a minute, I have money in an orphaned 401k account. Uh, I didn't know that I could gain access to that tax free um, and lend it and become the bank. Like they really drove that home. Like yeah. you, your ultimate goal should be becoming the bank, meaning yep. you have the money that you lend out and you charge interest, you know, yeah. for the privilege of, of having that cash. So how does that work? You have to have a network first of people that you trust. Correct. That have like a legitimate, uh, track record. Yep. Right. So, so when I started to speak in front of the room and then became a board member, I had access to a thousand people who were doing deals. Uh, okay. Let's cut that in half. Half of them are kicking tires. <laughs> so yeah, 500 people are yeah. actually active in the deals. Yep. So they knew me as this guy and they're like, Hey, Eric, you, I heard you talking about, you have some cash, you know, to help flippers. I'm like, yeah. And I knew them because I see them at meetings and I know they've been doing it for years and years. I'm yeah. Uh, give me the address. I'll show up to the project. Yeah, this is great. I want to be a part of it. How much do you need? And then I would charge, uh, and, and use my self-directed IRA. So I took the orphaned 401k, the mutual yeah. funds that were not being managed by anyone and put it into a place where I can manage it myself, not touch it 
I can't, you know, with the rules and regulations, right, yep. I can't change a light bulb in those properties, but I can lend it out for a fee. So yep. that's what I do. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. I love it. Now, for you, kind of going back to the podcast, I know you said, hey, early on in one of them, you know, we had Robert Kiyosaki, which is obviously, yeah, big name headliner. Uh, talk a little bit about the growth of podcasts, because, you know, oftentimes, once again, your first episode isn't, you know, Joe Rogan, all of a sudden, you know, it usually takes some time. So talk a little bit about how you built that up and things you did to market that and, you know, make that, uh, I guess, a bigger, bigger reach. Yeah. Yeah. I wish there was an exact design and blueprint that I could give, you know, but I will, I'll, I'll share my experience and, yeah. and, and hopefully someday maybe, you know, we could take this and, and turn it into a one pager. Yeah. Um, but it really, the first thing and the biggest challenge that people have is just getting started. Right. And so I had to just turn the mic on. I didn't even have a mic yet. So uh, I, I took my, I literally took my phone and walked into the basement when it was quiet and everybody was sleeping and I just spoke into it. Yeah. And then I posted that as a podcast, you know, using this app called anchor, yeah. which is free. Right. And they were like, Hey, here's a tool, use it. So I tested it and then I, and then I did it again and I did it again. And I started sharing it with my friends and my family. And they're like, this is pretty good, man. And then I, you know, this is, this is my personality. I can't just start something and not like 10 exit. So I was like, yeah. I'm going to buy a microphone. I'm going to buy a camera. I'm going to open a studio. So I did all of that. Like I, I couldn't help myself. Uh, and I started, a st <laughs> created this podcast studio and, um, that's how it sort of evolved. Like I, I loved it so much and I saw what it could do for me and for others yep. that, that it was such a great vehicle and a way for people to sort of get their message out there. And, and I started it really in a selfish, you know, selfishly to, 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 to answer the question that I was always getting was like, what do you do? Like you're, you're an investor or you're yeah. a creative guy or you're a podcast. What do you do? And I'm like, why don't you go listen to this show? It's the one-stop shop that tells everything that I'm doing. And that's how it's, so that was really the, 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 the solution to a problem that I was having at the time. I love it. So one thing I wanted to, once again, kind of dive into with you, Eric, uh, with our time remaining is the idea of partnering, right? Um, so one, we already talked about, hey, you need to partner with someone you trust, but two, talk a little bit about the delegation that comes. I think sometimes people try and just solo run things because, well, then I have full control. But if you delegate and it's with someone you trust, talk about the, you know, 10 X that can come from having a partner or, you know, the benefit of adding someone else with you. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't realize this, um, you know, right away as an employee, because as an employee, our mindset is trade time for dollars. Right. right? And when I finally got to the concept that that doesn't work, <laughs> you can't grow or be bigger than you are, uh, by trading your time for dollars. Cause we have limited time yep. right, on our hands, but you can leverage other people's time. Mm. And then I started to value my time, Phil, you know, to be more than $55 an hour. Yep. And I started to realize that my personal time, which I was charging for the agency, $150 an hour at the time. Um, I, so that was like, okay, that works. That's Eric Cabral's personal time. Yeah. And I started to, to realize not just charging people for that, for my time, but whenever I looked at a task, I was like, is that a $150 task an hour? Or can yep. I give that to someone else? And nine out of 10 times is give that to someone else. Right. right. Because there's someone on my team that would love to do that for $20 an hour. Yes. Right. Whether that be a social media post, writing a blog, you know, uh, putting stuff into a spreadsheet. I'm like, I was spending a lot of my time early on those menial, not menial tasks. They're necessary to business, but it wasn't worth my time when I know I could find someone else that's, that's, that's willing to do it for much, much, much cheaper. Correct. And then I started to spend my time on the 30,000 foot view relationships, right? Partnerships. Yep. What's the next deal? Like I had to have a vision of what was going to eventually become so that I can start to execute and manifest all the things that are necessary and use my time wisely by building relationships. That's all I do all day long now, Phil, is just have conversations like this and build relationships and build a network, build the relationships, build a network, connect people to others, get them on podcasts, all of that stuff. And now we just have a, a, an amazing team that, that executes on all the other things to keep the engine moving. I love it. I love it. 
Well, Eric, I want to say thank you so much for being on today and sharing your story. Um, you know, all the pivotal moments that have led to where you're at now and, you know, ultimately helping you accomplish which your goal, which is generational wealth and uh, passive income for generational wealth. And so thanks so much for being on. I can't wait to follow you and your story for the next three, four, five years and doing this again and uh, seeing what other new ventures you've, uh, you've added to the list. I appreciate you, man. Thank you so much for having me and spending the time uh, to tell my story. Appreciate that.